Hello and welcome back. In the last episode, we repaired a whole bunch of pretty HP boards from an HP 98035 clock interface module. We ended up with a whole bunch of deceased vintage components. One of them was a 1 MHz quartz crystal. We also had a few dead IC chips from the early 4000 series, one of the first CMOS chip series. They were both part of a simple clock circuit that you'd think should rarely fail. And since we're curious, heck, it's in the channel name, we thought we'd take a quick peek inside this fail component and see if we can learn something from it. We'll start with our biggie 1 MHz crystal. In the circuit, our fail crystal behave in a really bizarre way, giving a chaotic output. What in the world? In case you don't know yet, there is an excellent video about quartz crystal oscillators and how they work, link in the doodly-doo. In the same video, we also explain and show the typical expected response of a quartz crystal on the vector network analyzer, with a resonance, an anti-resonance, and a big switch in phase from plus 90 to minus 90 degrees in between. When I measured our misbehaving 1 MHz crystal on the VNA, I still got the somewhat familiar crystal curve, but the resonance was much weaker and the frequency was off. Man, it's a quartz, also it's completely off. It's at 1.0015 MHz, so maybe it's dying or something? So off to the torture instruments it goes. I chose to use the mill and not the Dremel, so I could do a more carefully controlled decapping. I use a small end mill and very light passes, so as not to further damage the crystal. And success, it looks like we were able to open it up cleanly. And I think I see what the problem is. It's, it's, I think it's missing a little piece. This whole piece just broke out. There's a scallop on it. Under the microscope, it's even more striking. Here's the big scallop, and you can clearly tell from the mark in the wall of the case where it hit it. But if you look carefully, there is another smaller neck in the crystal to the right, with another telltale hit mark on the case. And finally, it dawned on me that one of the contacts had failed entirely. The crystal is supported by tiny springs that double as contact attachment points. Here's a close-up of the good contact attachment point. Looks like it's held in place by a silver epoxy. Zooming back out, if you look at the extreme bottom right, you can see that it's not even attached anymore. I'm even surprised that we could see a quartz resonance still showing up on my VNA. The signal must have coupled capacitively to the crystal. And it's quite easy now to explain why the frequency was higher by 1 kHz. The crystal just got lighter when it lost a chunk. It must have been subjected to quite a jolt to fail in so many ways. But not to worry, says Ken Sheriff over on Patreon. It will buff right out. Ha ha. Very funny, Master Ken. So now it's time to give the loving treatment to our other fail component, an early CMOS IC from the 4000 series, a CD4069UB inverter to be exact. 
Conveniently, it was in an equally early ceramic package. These are very easy to open. Just give a good chisel blow near the seam and the top should go flying. You can see the chip on its small golden carrier right in the middle. The ceramic debris were easily cleared with a bit of compressed air. Under the microscope we go. Simple but pretty chip. Uh, there was no sign of catastrophic damage or even corrosion. To be honest, this was a bit expected and I venture that this IC died the common death of early CMOS ICs, victim of ionic migration or some other kind of contamination. By the way, in case you didn't know, your modern Intel processor also has a known finite lifetime too, and it will eventually succumb to electromigration, want it or not. I looked around for a little bit, but I really couldn't see anything suspicious. So instead, since this is a fairly simple circuit, uh, I called in again uh, our famed Ken Sheriff, so he would tell us what we are seeing here. Once again, this is one of the simplest ICs consisting of six inverters. The UB designation means that it is further simplified by having no buffer stages after the inverter gate. This is in order to minimize propagation delays. So this is in essence the simplest CMOS gate you can get. Two MOS transistors, a P and an N, forming a complementary pair, hence the C in CMOS. The two input gates of the transistors are tied together, so either the P is on or the N is on, but never the two at the same time. Which is what gives the CMOS its low power characteristics. There is no current going through the transistors, except when they are switching, since one of the two is always off. Although there are only 12 transistors on this die, one pair per inverter, it's still pretty hard to figure out where they are. I sent a picture to Ken and it came back colored this way. Do you see the transistors yet? Let me help a little. Here's the PMOS of one pair and here's the corresponding NMOS. The gate is the middle green trace. Both gates are connected together to the input pad towards the top. Similarly, the two drains are connected together on the yellow trace to the output pad at the upper left. The sources are connected to their respective rail voltages, plus for the PMOS and ground for the NMOS. And voila, we have made our inverter circuit. And there is even more than you can see in this die picture. Let's have Master Ken explain it to us. So it's a very simple chip. These two transistor structures are repeated six times because it's a hex inverter. You can see that the PMOS transistors are much bigger than the NMOS transistors. They're 2.5 times the size because NMOS transistors work much better. The electrons in NMOS transistors have 2.7 times the mobility of holes in the PMOS transistors. The plus signs on the die don't show the positive voltage, the fiducial markers for the alignment of the layers. If you look very closely at the markers, you can see they could have aligned the layers a bit better. Now each one of these inputs has um, two protection diodes and a resistor. The resistor is the little part where it narrows. Um, one protection diode connects to the high voltage and the other diode connects to the substrate. Um, this provides protection against over voltage and also against static discharge. Any excessive positive and negative voltage will flow through the diode and hopefully the chip won't be damaged. You can see the part number over here, 14069. RCA introduced the 4000 series of CMOS chips in 1968. For some reason, Motorola uses the 14,000 numbers for the same series of chips. There you have it from the master himself. Of course, this was child's play for Ken. In his blog, he routinely reverse engineers chips with tens of thousands of transistors, such as this Intel 8086, down to the transistor level. If you're interested in this kind of deep dives, go to his blog at the address below. Alright, I think we have learned a lot about the simple chip, except of course what we wanted to know, as we still have no confirmation of what it died from. Oh well, I hope we we'll still see you in the next episode. That's all, folks.